everyone, and thanks so much for coming. Today, I'm going to be giving a presentation about queen bumblebee behavior from spring to fall. So I want to start off by giving a little bit of information about myself. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Guelph, supervised by Nigel Rain. There, we are looking at uh, the impact of different environmental stressors on the movement behavior of bumblebee queens. Some of the stressors we've looked at are habitat loss and pesticide impacts on bumblebee movement. Uh, before that, I was a postdoc at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, uh, where I worked on connectivity uh, conservation work. And before that, I was a PhD student at York University, supervised by Dr. Sheila Kola, where I worked on bumblebee habitat conservation for North American bumblebee species. And in all of these three roles, I've worked at WPC, or worked with WPC, I should say, on a variety of different of projects that I will be presenting today. Oh, recording, recording in progress. All right, that's good to know. Let's just move that out of the way so I can see my own slide. All right, so we're going to start with what are bumblebees? So besides being the very best bees, obviously, because they're, they're so cute uh, and they're just the best, bumblebees are the big, huge flying bumblebees or bees that you see in your garden. Um, the, the genus for bumblebees is or bumbus, and that means booming. And if you've ever heard a bumblebee flying around your garden, you will know that that is aptly named because they are quite loud. What makes them distinct from other bees is their large uh, size and how hairy they are. Uh, they're also eusocial. That means that they have cooperative brood care. So the workers help take care of the young versus solitary bees where mom does all the work. They are found primarily in temperate regions. So on this global map here, the darker uh, orange or red colors are areas of higher diversity. So we've got the most diversity over here in the Himalayans, and we've got quite a bit in Europe. And we got a fair number here in North America where I am. We have about 260 bumblebee species globally, and about 50 are in North America. Bumblebees are sometimes confused with other bees, such as the honeybee or the carpenter bee. The biggest difference between honeybees and bumblebees are bumblebees are much bigger. They're also way hairier. Bumblebees also live in much smaller colonies, usually underground, but they can be in all kinds of weird places. While honeybees uh, will be in these humongous colonies with tens of thousands of workers, usually in hives, um, as they are a managed species and are used for agriculture. Most bumblebees also don't overwinter and they don't make honey. The other species that are commonly, or group of species, I should say, that are commonly confused with bumblebees are the carpenter bee. These guys look very similar to bumblebees, so it's very uh, easy to mistake these two. The biggest difference when you're looking at them is carpenter bees have their shiny bum, and they make holes in people's decks or other wood, and that's usually how people find them, being irritated by them. Bumblebees do not drill into woods. So if you have something drilling into wood, you've got carpenter bees. Uh, and usually every May or June, I get emails and text messages from people saying, I have this bee and it's chasing me around the garden and it's drilling holes in my deck. And I'm like, yes, you have carpenter bees. Like, how do I get rid of them? You don't really get rid of them. And there's uh, not much to be scared of with the bumblebee or the bees that are chasing you, sorry, the carpenter bees. The ones that's doing the chasing is the male and he can't sting. So all he's trying to do is protect his females in their nest or their flowers, they're very territorial, from anything coming anywhere near it. I mean, birds, flies, bees, humans, they'll try and chase you away. So if you're being frightened or terrorized by a male carpenter bee, just laugh at them so that their egos drop a little bit and they won't bother you as much. Uh, if you want to get them away from your deck, you can try and put a pile of wood off in the corner somewhere as decoy wood. But otherwise, um, just, just learn to love your adorable little pollinator helpers. And all these are really important pollinators. Um, there's something called generalists, meaning they feed on a variety of flowers. So there isn't one type of flower, flower that you can plant and you'll for sure get bumblebees. If you have lots of flowers, they will come and visit them. Uh, fun fact, they, their vision is more skewed to the purple end of the spectrum and they can see UV. So they really like purples and blues, uh, not so much red. Uh, so if you really want bumblebees, try and plant stuff in those colors. Um, they can forage under adverse weather conditions. This is different from some other pollinators. They're able to do this because they can flex their muscles and warm up. So they have the ability to thermoregulate compared to like honeybees, for example. They can't really fly really well when it's cooler, uh, windier, or rainy. But sometimes when it's raining, you'll find bumblebees out still foraging. And bumblebees are able to do this cool thing called buzz pollinate. So some flowers, including tomato, need 
their pollen to be vibrated out. So bumblebees can vibrate it out by just shaking or flexing their flight muscles really, really fast and that vibrates the plant to get the pollen out. I have a video, but it's very quiet. So I'm gonna talk, stop talking soon of a buzz pollination example, which is very cute. If you have your volume turned up, you can hear a little bzz, 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 bzz. That's the buzz pollination. So if you have rose, raspberry, uh, tomato, sometimes if you listen, you can hear that cute little sound. This is just a cell phone video. So it's not the greatest quality, but it's very cute. I love hearing it. Bumblebees also have a really cool colony cycle. Uh, right now we're getting into this part of the colony cycle. Hopefully you see my mouse. If not, we're, I'm pointing towards the spring and early summer phase. Um, so in early spring, the queens wake up from hibernation and they start foraging for themselves and looking for a nest site. Once they find a nest site, that's where they start laying their eggs and caring for the young. They also need to forage for themselves. So they're going out and foraging, going back to the nest, to keep the eggs nice and warm. So they're very, very busy. Once the workers start getting produced, the workers will take care of all the foraging responsibilities and help mama queen uh, incubate the eggs and take care of the young. Then into late summer and fall, we get new reproductors produced. Those are uh, new queens, which are called gynes at this stage, and males. The males and the new queens leave the nest, they reproduce. Then the queen overwinters by burying herself in the ground, and everybody else in the rest of the colony dies for the, they just die off. Um, and just the queen survives, and the colony cycle begins again in the spring. You will never probably see this um, in real life, I guess. Uh, this is a lab colony of the common Eastern bumblebee. So this, what you see here would normally be underground. So uh, unless you dug up the nest or were unfortunate enough to step on one, uh, you would not see this normally. This big gal right here is the queen. All these covered little uh, round shaped things are the eggs uh, and larvae that are developing. And any of these open little pots are nectar pots where they're keeping the nectar for them to eat. Now all these little gals here are workers helping take care of the colony. Now, unfortunately, we have uh, some species around the world that are in decline. Not all of our bumblebees are facing uh, some level of extinction, but of the ones that have been assessed, uh, about 25% are in decline. Uh, we have a lot of gaps uh, in especially Asia where we have not assessed a lot of our species. And if you remember from way back, one of those earlier slides, this is where we have most of our diversity and we just haven't been able to assess whether they're stable or declining or not. So the number of the species that are global are in decline could uh, change rapidly. Um, and sadly, our cutie little Athenis here that used to be in Canada, a lot of people know the rusty patch bumblebees, we have not seen since 2009. So hopefully we'll get to see this gal again soon. The reasons for declines of bumblebees are multifactorial. There isn't one main threat or one threat that we can address and it'll reverse all declines, although that would be nice. It's many things all combined. The strongest uh, threat in North America is likely pathogens, uh, spillover from managed bees. And what pathogen spillover means is we don't have to think back too far, we can think to COVID, when you got lots of people together, or in this case, lots of bees or farm animals, whatever it is, living all close together in like a managed capacity, it's way easier to spread viruses or other diseases. And the viral load is way bigger than if you're more dispersed and spread out in social distancing. So we have managed bees in the terms of honeybees and also bumblebees in greenhouses. They usually have much higher disease loads than just the wild bees flying around outside. But what sometimes happens is those bees from the greenhouse can escape the greenhouse and start pollinating the flowers nearby and spreading their disease all over the place. And then the native bees get on those flowers and they get sick and then it just amplifies. Uh, we know that there are some honeybee diseases that are spreading to native bees, um, stuff like deformed wing virus, uh, black queen brood cell. I think I'm mixing that one up, but it's another virus that's uh, nasty can spread to bumblebees. So managed bees aren't doing the greatest thing for our native bees right now. Also a uh, major threat is habitat loss from agricultural intensification and suburban development and just development in general. We're losing floral habitat, nesting habitat uh, for bumblebees. Our managed bees, including honeybees, are 
uh, aren't helping the situation as in they compete with native bees. Um, so if there's limited floral resources and you got honeybees of tens of, tens of thousands of workers versus bumblebees, which have hundreds of workers, the honeybees are gonna just dominate the floral landscape and they can sometimes uh, deplete the floral resources that bumblebees would have access to. Pesticides are another threat to bumblebees. Uh, if you spray an insecticide, which is meant to kill insects, it doesn't matter if you're trying to get the aphid, an insecticide is an insecticide, it's gonna kill insects, including bees. So they're not doing, they're not helping the situation. And climate change is becoming an increasingly problematic threat for bees with uh, warming temperatures beyond what they can survive. And as extreme weather events become more frequent, especially in the spring, where we might have a snowstorm and then rain and then drought, that's gonna really impact, the, especially the spring queens who are off by themselves trying to raise their young and forage with all these crazy changing weather patterns. So we've got a combination of things impacting our bumblebees. And bumblebees need three main resources in order to survive and what makes up their habitat. Four resources are flowers, they're pretty obvious. Um, flowers provide nectar and pollen, which they eat and is their food source. They need nesting sites to, as the name implies, put their nest in. Uh, most evidence for nesting is that they nest underground and stuff like abandoned rodent burrows, um, but they can be in all kinds of places. And overwintering habitat for the queens. Most uh, evidence suggests that they overwinter in um, shaded areas like forests or near trees, uh, or sometimes just below the leaf litter. And so now that I've given a little crash course on bumblebee ecology, the outline for the rest of the talk is uh, focusing on the research I've done with Wildlife Preservation Canada. So the first part will be the using detection dogs to find nests. We'll go over what we found with that project. And a project we did in for two years uh, using soil temperature to see if that uh, determines spring queen emergence timing. And finally, I'll go over some of the radio tracking work that I've done at the University of Guelph. So the first part again, it will be the training and usage of detection dogs to better understand bumblebee nesting habitat. We're gonna go over the challenges that we faced during this project and some of the opportunities. So I mentioned the three resources that bumblebees need. There's floral, nesting, and overwintering. Of those three, we know the most about floral, the least about nesting and overwintering. And why is that? Well, this video is showing a nest. Their worker just went into the entrance of the nest. So if you might notice, there is not really much obvious sign that there was a nest there. Your only sign is a worker is about to come walking through here and go into the entrance right there. So that's it. That's all you would see from the outside. So because they're so hard to find, we can't really study them. So it's hard to study something if you can't locate it. So we're gonna play a little game since we're on Zoom and can't have much fun in person. I have image A, B, and C here. In each one of these, there's a nest. I want you to try and locate the nest by pointing with your finger or your mouse. We're gonna start with A. So you get five seconds, study, 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 see if you can find where the entrance is. Did you pick there? If you did, you get a point. Right there. I don't know why my circle went I sorry. Now for B, this one up here. Where do you think the nest entrance is? Oh, there it is. Right there. Hopefully you picked that spot. If you did, you got another point. And now nest C. This is on an alpine mountain site. Where do you think the nest was there? Right there. So hopefully you got three out of three since they're so obvious where the nest entrance is, right? This one we found uh, A was in someone's backyard and they had noticed bees flying in and out of that spot. So we found that nest. Same with B and C was a very lucky find or unlucky depending on how you look at it. There was a researcher uh, surveying plants through their quadrat, which they use for sampling. Just throw it so it's randomly sampled and the quadrat is just a square where you count the plants in it. They put their hand down to bend over and survey the site and they just heard and quickly jump back, luckily, because they had placed their hand on the entrance of the nest. So because uh, nests are so hard to find, we wanted to use detection dogs to help us locate some nests so we can study more about the nesting biology of bumblebees. So the detection dogs were trained. Uh, the company that we used is Working Dogs for Conservation. They're based out in Montana. 
they train the dogs on uh, samples of the nest material. So that, that wax and the honey pots and every little bit of nesting material shown in this picture here. They did that by hiding the samples in cinder blocks and using just uh, standard training protocols for scent detection for dogs. And the dogs were able to find the, ne uh, the nest material. They were starting to detect the scent of the nest up to 15 meters away, which is really, really good. And if you've ever worked with bumblebees in the lab, which I'm assuming is a pretty niche thing, so you probably haven't, but as soon as you enter a room with a, with a bumblebee nest, you can smell it. You know they're in there. It smells sweetish, uh, but also a little stinky. Uh, just they have a very specific smell. So before we brought the dogs up to Ontario from Montana, we wanted to find some nests in the wild to help finalize the training of the dogs because all they've been exposed to is just hidden little samples um, indoors and outdoors, but it would be nice to have some uh, natural nests that the dogs can be exposed to. So we enlisted a huge community science volunteer effort to help find bumblebee nests. There was uh, social media blitzes going out. We brought people out searching for nests and we did our very, very best to locate any nests that we could. Uh, but unfortunately we did not find any before the dogs came. Um, so we did a lot of placing bumblebee nests to train the dogs in the field. Uh, and this is one of the trained dogs. She is narrowing in on the scent of a nest bit that we placed. When they sit, that means they detected the nest. The handler comes over and she just confirms that the dog is actually finding something so they're not pulling the wool over your eyes and just trying to get their ball, which they like. And then the best part is the reward where they get the ball and they get to play and they are so, so excited for this ball. And that's how it works. So in doing this, um, we discovered some constraints. So the first constraint is the dogs would probably benefit from finding more wild nests and having some exposure to that. Um, but given how hard it is to find nests, it might not be possible. And it's not necessarily something that has to be done since the dogs are able to find the nest scent, it just would be something that would be helpful in their training. Uh, but it does take a lot of uh, human hours. So it's something to consider if you ever wanted to use dogs to try and find nests. The second constraint is once the dog finds a nest, you need to, so whenever you're doing a uh, detection work with dogs, whether it's for drugs or bees, for example, you need to confirm that what the dog is detecting is actually there and then reward them. Otherwise, you're gonna start messing up their training. If you're rewarding them when they didn't actually find anything, they're gonna be like, oh, all right. So if I smell this or this or this or the thing I was supposed to be trained on, now I get my ball. So I'm just gonna detect for everything. Or if you don't reward them and they are finding the right thing, they're gonna be like, what the heck? What am I doing this for? You're not even rewarding me for finding the right thing. So it's really important to do that. But the problem with bumblebee nests is the only way to really confirm that there's a bumblebee nest there is to see bees entering or leaving. And depending on what stage the nest is in, that could take three seconds, could take 10 minutes, but the dog needs an answer now. So the other way you could do it is dig up the nest, but also nests that can have multiple entrances. So if the dog is smelling the nest appropriately at one entrance, but the bees decide to go enter the entrance over there, it's gonna be a little bit hard to figure out whether or not the dog is actually detecting the nest or not. Another constraint is you really have to think about your study design when you're gonna deploy dogs. So as I mentioned earlier, when they were training, they could pick up the scent of the nest from 15 meters away, which was great. I thought we'd let the dogs run around. We do some like little transects and they'd be finding nests left, right and center. But when we actually got out to the field, the dogs needed to be almost right on top of the entrance of the nest. The entrance, the nest is here. The dog's nose needed to be minimum where I am for my hands right now to be able to pick it up. So for some reason, out in the wild, bumblebee nests aren't emitting that much scent, so it's hard for the dogs to pick it up, which kind of makes sense. There are a lot of nest predators for bumblebees. A lot of things want to dig them up, get that sweet nectar, get that nice protein source of the larva. So it makes sense that bumblebees would have figured out some way to not let all the scents go out to be like, here, predators, come eat my young. So something to consider, you'd have to do much more targeted search 
with dogs, meaning grids or, or pointing like the trainer's doing here where they want the dog to search um, in order to make sure you're actually getting the scent of the nest in the dog's nose. The other thing to consider is different species have different phenologies, meaning they're active at different times. Uh, so there we have some early emerging species, species like the two-spotted bumblebee or Bombus bimaculatus, which can emerge, start a nest, make reproductors, and be done by July. Or we have a species like the common eastern bumblebee, which can be active from March or April, depending on the year. And you can see workers and sometimes males into October, November, depending on the year. So you got to think about that when you're going to deploy the dogs in order to find nests and also for confirming whether or not there was a nest present. Because uh, later in the season, when the colonies are much bigger and there's workers entering and exiting sooner, you'll be able to determine if it's a nest accurately sooner. The last sort of method methodological constraint is you need to think about what study site you want to try and release the dogs at uh, to have the best success or even just the best time in surveying. So there's um, some evidence that forests are really common spots for bumblebees to nest and they might prefer to nest in forests for some species, I should say. Uh, but some forests can have a lot of deadfall, thick brush, uh, could have caves and rocks and stuff. So that's really annoying for the handlers to have to climb over, as well as the dogs and the leashes can get tangled up. And that's just a lot of things to search. And it might not be practical. You're not going to be getting very far if you really want to search that site. And if you really want to search that site, you can. You're just going to have to really alter your expectations of how much of the area you're going to be able to search versus a more open forest or a field or an agricultural area, for example. So. Uh, I just love these pictures. Sorry, they just make me laugh every time. Uh, some implications of our study was that detection dogs might have more limited applications than we were hoping when we brought the dogs out for looking for nests. So you can mitigate some of these constraints of the dogs by really thinking about your study design and to optimize the dogs for locating nests. We can look at stuff like proxy measures um, for finding nests instead of looking for the actual nest itself. Um, but what those could be still need to be worked out. Uh, and it could need some additional exploration of how to optimize this method, or even as we gain more knowledge about nesting habitat in general, if we know that bumblebees, for example, prefer to nest under a pine tree, if then the dogs can be trained to search every pine tree in the forest or something like that. Um, to narrow down the search so they're not having to search literally every square inch of the forest in order to find a nest. This brings me to the second project that I've done with Wildlife Preservation Canada, and that is does soil temperature determine bumblebee queen emergence timing? So this is going into spring when bumblebee queens first appear. So we started this uh, in the pandemic. Uh, which was a little unfortunate. Uh, that was in 2021. We had, I think it was seven sites in Southern Ontario that had these soil temperature probes. Um, that's what this thing is standing in the ground. It's long-term data that uh, took soil temperature and air temperature uh, measurements every hour. So we were going to survey all these sites um, whenever the weather was good to get an estimate of when queens woke up. But with the pandemic restrictions that came in 2021 in the spring, uh, all of our sites except for one got shut down. So that year wasn't very successful, unfortunately. So we did a study again in 2022, but this time just focusing on the University of Guelph Arboretum, where we had soil and air temperature again. And I thought one hour data was really good, but this one had by the minute, which was just crazy, and also multiple temperature depths, which was great because we don't know exactly what depths uh, bumblebees hibernate at, and it kind of depends on the species perhaps, which depth they uh, overwinter at. So we got multiple measurements, which was great. Uh, and the data that we collected for the bumblebees was when we saw the first bumblebee species, which we recorded as the first emergence timing, as well as peak emergence, when we started seeing the most of a certain bumblebee species um, like that at us different times in the year. And we also got air temperature data from a nearby weather station. 
So here is a satellite map of the Arboretum. And these dots represent all the different locations where we found bumblebees and the different species, where you can see the number here. So we did this survey from April to just the beginning of June, and we found 92 bumblebees total, which is pretty good, of these species. We also recorded different behaviors. And the reason we did this was to help determine where we were in the phenology. So if they were doing something called nest searching, where that's where bumblebees fly low to the ground in kind of a zigzag pattern, and they land frequently and check out different spots. They only do that behavior when they're nest searching. They don't do that for anything else, except perhaps looking for an overwintering spot, but they're not doing that in spring. So if they're doing that behavior, they don't have a nest yet. So we're pretty early in their chronology. If they're resting on the ground, it's probably pretty early since they emerged too. When they first wake up from hibernation, they're pretty groggy. They don't do much. They'll fly a little bit, take a long nap, fly a little bit more, take a long nap, and then feed. Um, and another good sign that we're late in their phenology would be if they're carrying pollen. So if they have pollen in their back pocket, so their back leg has a pollen basket on it, and you'll sometimes see it as like a yellow or orange ball on their leg. That is the pollen that they've collected. They only collect pollen when they've started a nest, and they're bringing that pollen back to feed the young. So if we have a bee with pollen, we're pretty late in their in their phenology and she's got a nest somewhere. So here is some of the results of that work. I'm not showing you everything yet. What we have on the x-axis is the date. So this is the date of soil temperature and air temperature. So air temperature is the gray, the different depths of the soil temperature and the different colors, as well as the date that we first saw the different bumblebee species. And the temperature, sorry, is on the y-axis here. So we can see that there's definitive points where we started finding different species. Um, and it seemed like it peaked with Bimaculatus, which is the, or, or the two-spotted bumblebee, which is our earliest emerging species, right around May, almost May, where we got this warm peak. And then next came Impatience, which is another early emerging species, common eastern bumblebee, uh, common eastern bumblebee, sorry. Then Perplexus ferus and Rufocinctus. Then we did a breakpoint analysis, which is looking for something that caused our graph, you imagine a line graph like this, to go from this kind of slope to like a this type of slope. So at that point, like looking for the inflection point, like something happened there that caused something to change. So in our case, it would be we're seeing if there's a temperature that determines if we're going to go from hibernating to waking up. So that's what we were looking for. Anywhere that I have green is where the breakpoint analysis said, yep, something's going on here. So at all of our soil temperature depths, um, there was a breakpoint analysis where Bombus bimaculatus decided to wake up. For Bombus impatience, it was only at 10 centimeters. Once there was that breakpoint, that's when impatience decided to wake up. For perplexus, only air temperature apparently determined when perplexus was going to wake up. And for the other two, they were responding to everything. So the reason why this is interesting is it could suggest that these are the uh, depths where the species are overwintering because if they're responding to the temperature at that depth, why else would they respond to that temperature at that depth unless they were there? Or in this case of perplexus, the air temperature. So, so far, the data, the only data I've, I've analyzed for this, because I'm way behind, and I know that I'm way behind, but um, I'm going to get to it, uh, was for the first day of emergence. So the next part that I'm going to do would be the cumulative proportion of emergence. So that's what we're looking at when most of the bumblebees are now up and uh, flying around, to see if we get any different results there. And the last part of the presentation is um, some radio tracking results that I have from my work at the University of Guelph. So as I mentioned earlier, there are some species that are in decline and it's becoming more wide known that we have pollinator species that are in decline. So this has caused increased interest in creating pollinator habitat and spending all kinds of money to help um, bring back pollinators, which is great. Um, but we're only focusing so far on pollinator gardens and creating pollen or sorry flower gardens and uh, pollinator gardens, but we're not looking so much at the other habitat stuff. 
So it could be stuff like nesting and overwintering that are also important and causing their decline if we're missing these aspects. Um, but we don't know. We don't know if we're limiting on nesting habitat versus floral because we just don't have the information. So we're hoping that through studying their behavior, we'll be able to figure these things out. Movement is a really, really important behavior to study for any animal, whether it be a bee or an elk, to study a lot about habitat selection. So for example, we can look at stuff like connectivity and this map here, which is showing just the movement of from point A to point B, that's all connectivity means, which can be important for uh, finding resources. If this spot over here is depleted, we can go over there. If you've got mates from over here and you're over here, how do you get there? And also connectivity can get way more important with climate change because species are going to need to be able to track their changing climate, which is presumably North and North America. But if you've got a big freeway in the way and you can't cross the freeway, then that's going to be a big problem for connectivity. So by studying movement, we can look at stuff like that. Movement's also really important for determining habitat preference, use, dispersal, foraging distance. Uh, because we can see if we're tracking a movement of an animal and they're spending all their time over here and no time over here. It's like, well, something over here is really important and they're preferring this spot over, over here for some reason over this spot. Or if you can always see that they're avoiding something, then that could be a barrier to dispersal. Like if they're never crossing the big busy highway, then perhaps they can't, perhaps they don't want to cross the highway. So that would be important to know to mitigate impacts on connectivity. Uh, some animals, not necessarily bumblebees, have uh, home ranges. It's uh, for some species, that's usually where they're, if they're territorial, they're going to defend that. And that's the area that they use. Other species like bumblebees, though, will have temporal space use. So that means in different times in the season, they'll use different areas more. So that can be really important for bumblebees where in the spring, they're looking for nests. In the summer, they need flowers so that they can grow the colony. And then later in the fall, they need somewhere to reproduce. And they also need an overwintering spot. So those could all be different areas. And by studying their movement at these different um, life stages, we can figure out what spaces are important for these species. So we've been tracking animal movement for a long time. Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, we know a lot about habitat selection from other animals, but they're usually a lot bigger than bees. We've got these backpack uh, backpacks for birds to track their where they migrate and look at their nesting and other habitat selection stuff. We got uh, these big huge collars and ear tags we can put on these nice big mammals here or nice huge necklaces which are usually also satellite tags so you just well not well maybe it's hard I don't know you trank trank your polar bear put this necklace on and then walk away and your data is being collected for you on this nice necklace versus bees. So they're much more challenging, I would say, to tag smaller animals um, because they're smaller. That means you need a smaller battery. Uh, you have a smaller computer that you have to put in there to some because something has to transmit that signal for where that uh, animal is, and it needs the battery to to power that system. But luckily, we do have some tags that are small enough for bees. So here's one of my bumblebee queens with a tag on her back. That's this white thing here. Uh, here is a tag with a sharpie for scale. This long part here is the antenna, which sends the signal. And here is a little computer bit with the battery. Um, when we put them on the bees, we don't put the full antenna uh, on the bee just because we found they were getting tangled in vegetation. So we cut them in half about there. So it's a little bit shorter when it actually goes on to the bumblebees. With this tag, we've been tagging since 2021 and we've studied a bunch of different questions um, using the tags, which are really, really informative. We've looked at how far away they fly from nests. We opportunistically found a nest. That's where that nest video came from. So we tagged bumblebee queens that were coming out of the nest and saw how far they flew from the nest. We can look at how far they fly, period, their entire life and how long they're, well, not their entire life, sorry, entire tag life, I should say, and how long they're flying around for. We looked at what type of landscape features they select. Do they like forests? Do they like the ag areas? Do they like the high floral areas? We looked at the behaviors they're displaying based on their flight path. So if they're flying all over the place or turning a lot, what could that behavior be? And what does that mean? And we're also looking for uh, possible overwintering and nesting locations. We've also done all of this um, 
with different pesticides to look at sublethal impacts of pesticides. And this year we're doing a habitat study and potentially a nutrition study. So the methods for this project, um, we have this, the results I'm showing so far just with the one study, not the habitat study where we have two sites. So it's at Rare Charitable Research Reserve near Cambridge in Southern Ontario. We set up radio towers, which are what receives the radio signal from the tank. And that's what this guy is here. And we've set up 44 of them across Rare, which this is a satellite image of the site, which each yellow dot is a tower location. And the blue circle is the approximate radius of the towers, which is about uh, 200 meters away. Um, so these towers consist of three antennas, the big mass pole, a solar, pa solar panel, computer box with a bunch of wires and cables and computers and other bits in there, a battery a little bit smaller than the size of the car battery. And all of this needs to be set up in the middle of this field. So this was great to do in 2021 and COVID, you know, to lose some of that uh, COVID weight that was put on, but it was a lot of work just to do that one part. Uh, and then we needed to attach the radio tags to the bumblebees. The way that we do that is super duper scientific. Uh, they're attached with crazy glue or super glue. Um, this year, crazy glue is working the best versus we also tried Gorilla Glue. We do that by cooling down the queens. Uh, we only use queens because they're the biggest of the casts. Uh, we cool them down and then the bees don't move once they're cooled down. This allows us to spread their wings apart and glue the tag onto their backs here uh, safely without getting any glue on their wings, because that would be very, very bad if that happened. Then they wake up and uh, sometimes they just hang out on my fingers here, stealing my warmth. Other times they want to get the heck out of there, so they fly away immediately. Other times they're happy for me to bring them dandelions so they can have a nice snack for free without having to go anywhere. But eventually they all leave. It takes anywhere from a second after they wake up to half an hour when they decide they don't want to be around me anymore. They go fly around the site and they do fly. So here are some flight paths of just three sample bumblebees that I picked flying around the site. The orange flights are more recent locations that they've gone to versus the blue. So that's them zipping all over the place. Um, we found that on average, their total flight for the time that we tracked them was almost six kilometers, was 5.7 kilometers, which is pretty far. I should mention that these were gynes. So these are the new queens produced at the end of the year. So their job is to go out, mate, get fat so they can survive overwintering and then overwinter. Um, the minimum days that we tracked them flying was 20 and the maximum was 54, which is really good. The batteries are only guaranteed for about 21 days. So when we got 54 days, that was pretty, pretty good. Um, but on average, it's just over a month. They were flying for almost 36 days. And the coolest result, which just blows every bee person's mind when I tell them, is that they're flying at night. They're not flying at night that often. It's about 15% of the time. They're still flying at night for some reason, which is just, I don't know, it's just crazy. There's nothing I've heard of before, but for some reason they're doing it. So then we opportunistically found that nest, which on our study site was about here, was right on the edge of the property. Uh, so we could tag bees that came from there and measured their maximum and average distance from the nest. Uh, so the maximum and average distances uh, flown, which is pretty similar to what we know about how far foragers fall, fly from the nest. So it seems that guines are flying maximum about two kilometers away from the nest, but on average, they like to stay a little closer, uh, more in the 300 to 500 meter range. And that's very similar to what workers are doing when they're foraging. And here is some data showing the last occurrence point of our bumblebees. So this is the spot where we last saw the bee. So we don't know whether that's the overwintering spot, just where the battery happened to die, where the tag maybe fell off, where the bee decided, you know what, I don't like this site anymore, I'm leaving. Um, but it could be overwintering, which would be very, very exciting if it was. Um, so we have some results from the last occurrence point. Here's a map of the study site with all the different guides and where the last occurrence point was. And interestingly, we have this huge cluster of points here. There's so many bees in this one spot. And most of those, I think all but two, were from the nest, which were over here. 
So for some reason, all the nest mates are deciding to go over here and hang out together, um, potentially in their overwintering site. And if that is an overwintering site, it's interesting that nest mates are deciding to hibernate together, or maybe they're just traveling out of my study site together. The maximum distance from the last from the nest, sorry, where this last uh, occurrence point was, was 660 meters away, which is, is an overwintering site that's pretty close. So they're not moving that far away from the nest. And this was almost always in high floral areas. Uh, so it could be that the bees are liking like to overwinter or last occurrence in areas of high floral um, spots where there's lots of flowers. Or it could be that the bees were getting one last meal in before they had to go in overwinter. Because uh, the fatter they are, the more likely they are to survive overwintering. So it could be important to ensuring their survival. So in summary for the radio uh, tracking projects, we can use radio track radio tags to track bumblebees. When we first started this project, it wasn't clear that we could. Um, and this is at least for the largest species, which in our area is Bombus impatiens or the common eastern bumblebee. And at least for the queens, the queens are able to handle the tag uh, well. Um, and with these tags, we can learn more about dispersal, more about important areas for bumblebees, especially at life stages that are hard to study, like nesting and overwintering. Uh, and we can uh, look at stuff like the sublethal impacts, as I mentioned, for pesticides and their impacts on flight. So we've done uh, some other experiments. Uh, that I'm just, again, way behind on, so I can't show you the results for, which uh, I'm going to catch up on eventually. I noticed uh, Nigel and my supervisors on spring and summer queens. Uh, the results I showed you were for gynes, so the ones that come out in late summer or early fall. We've also tagged spring queens to see how they move once they wake up from hibernation and where they're going to make their nests. We've tagged queens that were overwintered in pesticide spiked soil to see if the pesticide can then leach into the bees and potentially impact their movement. Um, and we're also looking at land cover impacts on movement. So it's hard work organizing citizen scientists for the detection dogs, helping me look for nests, helping me do surveys in the Arboretum for spring queens. And of course, a huge team that helped me put up all those radio towers and tag the bees. Um, so I want to thank all of those people and thank you all for uh, coming to my talk and listening to it. There is a video there in slow motion for the second half of a bee just waking up after being cold and flying away. Oh, yes, if you have any questions, I think put them in the chat, right, Taylor? Yes, thank you so much, Amanda. That was great. And yeah, any any questions can go in the chat, or if you have any other questions you want to ask them directly, you can also put your hand up and we can unmute you as well. So we do have one comment right now in the chat, and it's from Gil Miranda, and they say, hi, Amanda, could you see, uh, or could we see the threat status slide again? Uh, are those statuses from Kosiwik? IUCN red list, or where are we getting those from? Uh, my computer is currently crashing, so oh, yeah. I cannot. <laughs> um, so I can't bring you back to that slide. You, are, I think, are referring to the slide with the, the map, and it said which ones are uh, each of the threatened sites from IUCN. If that is the case, it's from a paper, um, Cameron and Sad. 2020. Um, I can't even open the chat because my computer is crashing, so I can't put it in there for you. But uh, yes, it's from a paper on the status of bumblebee health, global status of bumblebee health, I'm pretty sure is what it's called. Great. Any other questions? I had a quick question actually about the uh, the transmitters. So do you find that you are ever worried about them like inhibiting flight? You said that you knew that um, the larger queen or like the larger species were okay to carry them. So how, how did you kind of figure that out? Or how do you know that maybe some smaller species wouldn't be okay to carry those transmitters? So the way I know that they're able to carry them is we put them on them and they were able to fly. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
the we are going to try and test how much the tags are having an impact on the queens in um a wind tunnel experiment we just haven't got to that yet mm -hmm. uh, but there are other researchers who have done tags on different species uh and workers to see how it impacts their flight. And other species that are smaller uh, struggled a little more than the bigger species, uh, but they can fly. It's just they do have a little bit more of an impact. Uh, and there's other studies that have used workers before, so they can do it. It's just weird, especially because we're using queens, which are important for reproduction and continuing uh, the colony. We don't want to mess with them too badly. Um, so we want to make sure we're picking the biggest ones. For sure. And do you ever worry that um, like maybe a bee would be eaten by a predator or something like that? And it's still maybe potentially tracking. I'm not sure exactly how the trackers work, but. Uh, it does cross my mind. Uh, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I don't know if it's happened. The tags are compatible with, uh, it's called the MODIS network. Um, it's used mainly for migratory birds. So if a bird ate it and was flying on the and to stay within the range of the MODIS network, we'd be able to detect it. But so far that hasn't happened. Um, but I am curious if it would still work after being through the digestive tract of something. Yeah, for sure. And then you'd have maybe a very, a bee going a very far away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, so we have a question here from Janet Caravan. Hi, Amanda. Um, have a high floral garden with fruit and vegetables regularly have a bumblebee nest in the chickadee nest box bumbles that fly at night are they workers or queens and what time of year spring or summer the ones we saw at night that were flying um were queens um so it, the ones oh i think we may have lost her Maybe we'll just give her a moment and see if she can reconnect here. The joys of, of Zoom and the internet. I'm not seeing her reconnecting. But Janet, maybe something I'll put Amanda's um, website link in the description and maybe you can have a look there and maybe even reach out for her for an answer to that question. Give me one moment here. So here is Amanda's website link. And I also invite anybody else to, to visit her website. It's very beautiful and very informative. Oh, there she is. Let's add her back in. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> hey, uh, so I don't know how much of the answer you heard or if anything. Uh, maybe we'll just start the answer again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it was, so the results I showed were from Gain. So they're the new queens that are produced at the end of the season. So those results were from August and September. So it would have been um, summertime that they were flying around at night. And you said you had a nest in a chickadee box. I think, yeah, they, they nest in weird spots, but it's really cool that you've got one. Um, they're usually friendly as long as you don't mess with the nest. So I wouldn't go and poke it or anything because you might, you might anger some bees. Um, there was a study that was looking at bumblebees. One decided to make a nest in an already established bird nest and eventually kicked the bird out of its own nest, which is interesting. Great. Any other questions? Okay, so one here from Karen Davidson Taylor. Uh, Amanda will be a pollination gulfs bumblebee workshop. Oh yeah, someone promoting your workshop here. So Amanda will be at pollination gulfs bumblebee workshop at 
at Clare Road Emergency Service Center on Clare Road in Guelph on Saturday, June 24th between 9.30 and 11 a.m. So anybody here can go and check that out as well. Yeah, cross your fingers for sun. I know it's yeah. calling for some rain, but let's see what happens. Hopefully sun. It's still a bit away. It could change. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we'll stop it there if there's no more questions. And I did link Amanda's um, uh, website in the chat if anybody wants to check that out. And uh, thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Thank you again, Amanda. Great talk. Thanks, Taylor. <laughs>